Hello from Sheldon Road. Today the service is led by Trevor Ranger and introduced by Ruth. But first some information to help those hard of hearing. If you're watching this on YouTube, either on a computer, tablet or phone, or on a smart TV, all of our services are subtitled. On a computer, you can switch them on by clicking the CC button on the lower right side of the screen. On a smart TV, you may find it easier to pause the video, then click on the CC button. Click on English, auto-generated. Then close on the X symbol. You can also select numerous other languages if you prefer. The subtitles are generated by YouTube and may not be completely accurate. Welcome to our service today. A huge welcome to our All Age service today. It's lovely that you can join us and we hope that you feel part of God's worldwide family as you worship with us. My name is Ruth and I'm one of the worship leaders here at Sheldon Road Church and you'll see my husband Trevor later. We both work for Christian charities, Trevor mainly with children and young people and I work mainly with older people and seniors. But we really appreciate the opportunity and blessing that our work gives us in having contact with so many churches and Christians around the West Country. Isn't it wonderful sometimes just to remind ourselves that we are part of that whole company of heaven and earth that loves and worships our great God. Especially at the moment when we seem to be separated more than usual. Let's begin our service today by praying together. Dear loving Heavenly Father, we praise you for your wonderful faithfulness and your love for each of us. We pray that you will help us to worship you now and be aware of your presence with us. Lord, speak to us, we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting forty days and forty nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the t devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is writ also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendour. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him, and angels came and attended him. Today is the first Sunday in Lent, a time when traditionally Christians around the world remember what Jesus did when he went into the desert to prepare himself for the ministry ahead of him. He wanted to get ready physically and emotionally and spiritually, so for 40 days he didn't eat anything. Now, normally that's not a very good idea, but Jesus knew what he was doing. And we read in the Bible that when he went into the desert, he was tempted, tempted to do all sorts of wrong things. He was tempted to turn stones into bread and to misuse his power. He was tempted to jump off a building to prove who he was, that the angels would come and rescue him. He was tempted to bow down in front of Satan in order to, to have all the kingdoms of the world, which is a big fat lie from the devil, but, but Jesus resisted the temptation time and time again. We all face temptation and there's nothing wrong in that, but Jesus kept on resisting the temptation every time he did the right thing. I wonder sometimes whether the biggest temptation that Jesus faced was to just give up hope. After all, he knew what was going to happen in the next three years. Oh sure, there would be some good times, some really happy times with his friends and family, but he also knew there would be times when they would abandon him, when they would turn their backs on him, when he would be arrested for something that he hadn't done, when he'd be beaten up and thrown into prison, and he also knew that at the end of the three years he would be put on that cross at their very first Easter, and he would suffer the most agonising and humiliating death imaginable. He must have been tempted to give up hope. Well, more than a thousand years earlier, in another desert, the people of God also were tempted to give up hope. You see, God had delivered them in the most wonderful way. Under the leadership of Moses, they'd left Egypt, where they'd been slaves for hundreds of years, and they'd crossed the Red Sea, and now they'd been promised that very soon, soon, very soon, they would enter the Promised Land, a land that should be ideal for them to live in. But right now, they were going to have to prepare for it, just like Jesus had to prepare for his ministry. And they spent 40 years, not days, but 40 years, in the desert, wandering from place to place, listening to what God was say, saying and telling them to do. God was with them every step of the way and provided for their needs. But on one occasion, they found themselves in a place called Sin. Hmm. Interesting name for a part of the desert. But when they got to this place, they realised that there was no fresh water. Now, you can live without food for a little while, but you can't live without water. They needed it desperately. And they called out to Moses and they said, why did you bring us to this place? Wouldn't it have been better if we'd stayed in Egypt where we'd been slaves all those years? At least there we had water. And Moses started to get desperate. He needed to know that God was with him. He needed to know that God had a plan. He needed to know that there was hope. Uh, I'm going to go outside and tell you what happened next. Uh, but it's bitterly cold out there, so I've got my scarf and I've got my hat, uh, and I'm going to leave you with Ruth to tell you what's going to happen next. See you in a minute. At our church, we have a number of university students whose studies have been disrupted by COVID-19. 
We put a few questions to them and this is what they had to say. Hi, I'm Katie and I'm currently in my second year of a maths degree. I'm supposed to be at Exeter, but right now I'm holed up in my childhood bedroom doing online learning. It's great fun. I think one of the hardest bits of the pandemic for me is that it stopped me moving forward in living independently. I expected to have spent the year looking after myself, making new friends and having new experiences. But living at home in lockdown is just like being back at school, really. However, during this time, I feel that God has taught me the importance of social contact. When I get the opportunity, I'm now ready to step out of my comfort zone and embrace new friendships and opportunities to socialise. Roll on September! <laughs> My prayer for students is that we'll all be vaccinated before we go back in September so that we can have a safe, fresh new start for the new year. What has been the most difficult is having to adjust as things have changed, sometimes doing online lessons, sometimes travelling to college, so remembering to stay safe when I'm on public transport, and also the changing rules at work with different restrictions over time. It's harder to keep a routine when things are frequently changing. I've learnt to appreciate all the time I spend with my friends and family. I would normally see my friends most Friday evenings at church and at college every week, but because I haven't been able to see many people, I value any time that I have with them more and I don't take it for granted. I pray that students are able to stay focused while studying from home because it can be easy to lose motivation and get distracted. Um, I think I would say the hardest thing has been getting used to less social interactions and not being able to spend time with family and friends and celebrate social occasions. But we still have been able to do that online, but obviously it's not the same as when you get to do it in real life. And I think that's been not hard, but just a bit, I guess, sad in a way because you can't spend quality time is a bit difficult especially when like being a uni student when I'm online most of the time working on a computer it's kind of a bit difficult to then talk to people online as well because it just feels so virtual and it's just getting used to the virtual world I think is just something a bit difficult at the moment especially for everyone as well not just me so yeah, that's probably been the hardest thing at the moment, getting used to that and not being able to spend that quality time with friends and family. I think God has taught me to be grateful for everyone around me and because obviously not being in, per in person with people as well, you just remember all your previous memories and all the happy times that you've been able to enjoy in person and I think being grateful and practicing gratitude probably and just appreciating where we are right now and who we're with and being able to live in such a nice community and a family church community as well and appreciating all of our connections and also our home as well and where we live because we live in quite a nice beautiful area in Wiltshire so we're quite lucky really. At the moment my prayer for students would be to help them with their motivation and their studies um, during this time because obviously it's difficult because you have to kind of give yourself the motivation as well because you're not surrounded by students all the time. You're not with teachers sort of pressuring you every day to get on with things and I think people may be lacking motivation at the moment, especially being at home, maybe struggling to work because there's a lot of other people around trying to work too and I guess that's quite difficult especially if they have younger siblings as well and obviously the wi-fi connection can be a bit temperamental sometimes but yeah I think probably just motivation and maybe confidence as well to reach out for support if they need to because I think sometimes you can really struggle with work and I think that extra support from teachers would be quite useful professors or whoever's helping you learn and study um, because they will be there to support and I know sometimes it can be difficult to reach out but I think 
if you are struggling then that would be a good thing to do as well so that's my prayer for uni students at the moment Hi, I'm Dan. I go to Bath Bar University and I'm studying primary education. Um, the hardest bit about this pandemic for me has probably been the mental health side of it. Um, not only me struggling with it at times, but also seeing my friends uh, struggle with it a lot as well. And then trying to like balance your studies at the same time. It's just not a very easy thing to do and it's having some quite, quite bad impacts on uh, people at the moment so I think that's probably been the hardest part about the pandemic personally um what God has taught me this year no matter how difficult the problem or how bad the situation may seem you have to give all your worries and fears to the Lord um and I picked out from the Bible uh Psalm 55 verse 22 uh cast your bur- your cast your burden upon the Lord and he will sustain you uh, I think that rings true, especially now. Um, all the issues we're going through, the problems we have in isolation, studies, just got to give it all to the Lord and realise that he is much bigger than all of this. So um, he will see you through as long as you cast your burdens to him. Um, my prayer for students right now is, uh, I pray that God gives us peace and that he gives us the strength to get through tough times, but also that he reminds us reminds us that we're always in his arms and he's, he's going to look after us no matter what. So thank you very much. Hello. We're going to pray for the students who come to the church or are connected to families in the church. We have 11 students in their own unique situations, going back, studying at home, delaying a year, waiting to start their course, stuck in this country. We pray for them not being able to live independently, missing people, feeling cut off, lonely, unable to get out and pursue their normal activities, for whom the experience is very different to what they expected. We pray that they will be able to balance their studies, giving them the motivation they need to stay focused. We pray that the technology they are using will be reliable. We also pray for their mental health, When there are problems, we pray that they will have opportunities to share that with somebody they trust. Help them to look out for their friends. Give them good relationships with those whom they live. Help them to learn resilience and give them strength in the tough times. We pray for those unable to get back to the country they're studying in. We pray that arrangements to fly and quarantine will go smoothly. As they think about next year, where they go next, guide them to make good decisions. We pray for the vaccination programme that students will be able to be vaccinated before returning to uni in September. Thank you for each one of them and be with them in their disappointments and their achievements. Let them know that whatever situation they are in, you love them and are with them. Help them to lean on you in the difficulties and to thank you when things go well. We are all having a wilderness experience at the moment and the next prayer has a response for all of us as we acknowledge the presence of God. When prompted, please respond with the words, Jesus, we choose to walk with you. Sometimes we feel like we're walking through a wilderness. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. When our spirits feel dry, help us trust in your spirit. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. Fasting seems difficult. Prayers seem unanswered. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. The world howls like wild animals all around us. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. We can choose to worry or to trust you to provide. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. Temptation is everywhere. Doubts can overwhelm us. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. You know what it's like to walk through this desert. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. 
You long to transform us with wilderness worship. Jesus, we choose to walk with you. Amen. Moses was absolutely desperate. All this time he'd been leading the people of God, he had simply done what God had called him to do. And now he found himself in the middle of a desert without anything to drink, being moaned at by thousands and thousands of people. He cried out to God, what am I to do with these people? And if Moses had been on his own, things really would have been desperate. But the Bible clearly says that God was with him and God gave him some instructions. Moses, he said, I want you to lead your people. You're the man. You're the person I've called. I want you to lead your people. Stand in front of them and walk towards Horeb and lead your people to that place. And I want you to bring with you the elders of Israel. I want you to know that you're part of a team, that you're not on your own, and I want them to be able to see what's going to happen next. Also, do you remember the uh, staff that you used to, to turn the water into blood in Egypt? Well, I want you to take it with you as a reminder, as a physical reminder of something special I've done in the past. You're going to need this again. Oh, and when you get to Horeb, when you get to the rock at Horeb, Moses, I want you to hit it with your staff <laughs> and water will come out and you'll all have the water that you need. I'm not sure what went through Moses' mind at this point, but the Bible says he did what God called him to do. He led the people, he took the elders with him, he took the staff with him, and when he got to the rock at Horeb, he looked up and realised it was a massive, massive rock. He couldn't see where any of the water could possibly come from, but he trusted God, and he did what God called him to do. I don't know if he hit the rock once or twice or, or more or how hard he hit it but he hit it and what happened next was quite extraordinary. At first nothing happened but then there was a gurgling sound and a wurgling sound and after a while water suddenly started coming out of the rock in front of everybody. Moses looked at Aaron, Aaron looked at the elders of Israel, the, the elders of Israel looked at the people and everybody was smiling because they had water, fresh, clean water coming from a rock. They went and grabbed their, their jugs and their mugs and their containers so that they could drink and they could wash and they could do all the things they needed to do with clean, fresh water. God had kept his promise. Moses had listened to him and now they had water. Now that story we've just heard comes from the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 17. And the interesting thing is, if you read that chapter, and if you read that account, you'll notice something at the very end. It doesn't mention any water coming out of the rock. But we know it happened because of two things. Firstly, God said it would. And secondly, Moses did what God said he should do. You see, the question wasn't whether God would keep his promise to Moses. The question was, would Moses listen to God and do what God had called him to do? So the writer doesn't tell us that the water came out of the rock. We just know it happened because God always keeps his promises and because Moses did, did what he was told. But then in the book of Numbers in the Bible, we read of another account where water came from the rock. And it's a different account, it's a different time and it's in a different place. The same thing happened again, the people found themselves in a place in the desert where there was no water. And they cried out to Moses and said, why have you brought us to this place? And they were moaning and groaning and again Moses called out to God, what am I to do? And again God spoke to Moses. But this time he said to Moses, when you get to the rock in this other place, not Horeb but this other place, instead of hitting the rock I want you to speak to the rock. This is an even stranger thing for Moses to have to do. So Moses led the people, took the people of Israel, took the elders with him, uh, took the staff with him, and when he got to the rock, what did he do? Well, he was supposed to speak to the rock, but instead he used his stick again and hit it. And at first, nothing. And then, after a moment or two, the water started to come out of the rock. <laughs> And there it was, a dribble at first, but then it got more and more and the people were refreshed 
The people had water to drink and water to wash in. But something wasn't right. Moses hadn't done what he was supposed to do. When I was 22 years old, just a couple of years ago now, when I was 22 years old, I went to Moreland's Bible College, a theological college. Uh, and it was the place where uh, a year later I was to meet my future wife, Ruth. But in that first year, I can remember we had a special visitor come to speak to us. His name was the Reverend Jim Graham, and he was a very well-known speaker and preacher at the time. Now I confess, I can't remember anything he said that day except for one sentence. And this is what he said, and I will live with it for the rest of my life. It's been so helpful. He said, God loves to do the same thing in different ways. God loves to do the same thing in different ways. And whenever I remember what he said to us that day, I think about the story and the stories we've heard today about how God wanted to refresh his people in the desert, to give them the water that they needed to carry on living and to thrive. But he wanted to do it in different ways. The first time he spoke to Moses, he said, I want you when you get to the rock at Horeb to hit the rock and water will come out. And God kept his promise. Moses listened to what God said. He obeyed God, he trusted God and water came out. The people were refreshed. But later on, when God wanted to do exactly the same thing, but in a, a different way, well, Moses didn't get it quite right. This time, God said, I want you to speak to the rock. 
Now, why he said that, I don't know. Maybe he was testing Moses. Maybe he was just keeping everybody on their toes. But he definitely wanted to do the same thing in a different way, to speak to the rock. But when Moses got there and he saw the rock, instead of speaking to the rock, he hit it again. Now, God kept his end of the bargain. Water came out and the people were refreshed. God had done the same thing. But Moses hadn't listened to God. He hadn't done what God had called him to do. And God wasn't very pleased about this. Why did Moses not do what God said? Well, maybe it was just that he didn't listen. He just thought when he got there, oh, it, 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 probably I misunderstood and, and just didn't get it right. And he just went back to hitting the rock with the stick like he did the first time. But I suspect it was because he didn't actually trust God. And when he got there, he didn't want to look silly and talk, and talk to a rock in front of all those people. And he just fell back on what he had done before. Well, it worked last time. Why shouldn't it work again? And Moses hit the rock instead of speaking to it. You know, as a result of Moses not trusting God, he wouldn't be leading the people of Israel for much longer. He would never see the promised land. A man called Joshua would end up doing that. Moses died before the people got to the promised land. He was no longer leader, and all because he hadn't listened to God. You know, I do remember what Jim Graham said all those years ago, God loves to do the same thing in different ways. Whenever I meet somebody who thinks the way I do, but does things differently, maybe they like go into schools like I do, or they go into churches like I do, or, or they do holiday clubs, but they do them slightly differently. And I'm not sure I'm very comfortable with it, but do you know, I have to tell myself, God loves to do the same thing in different ways. Or maybe when we meet up with people from another church and we find that they worship God differently, they sing different songs or they pray differently or they have different actions or they, or they do things differently, we think, oh, I'm not sure that's right. But you know what? God loves to do the same thing in different ways. And there's a real temptation sometimes to, to do what Moses did and just to fall back on the way we've done things in the past. I often have to tell myself, to be aware of what God is saying today, not what God did yesterday. And in our churches, we need to do the same thing. We need to ask ourselves, what is God wanting us to do today? And how is he wanting us to do it? Because it may be that he wants to do the same thing in different ways. In the same way that he reached out to people in the past, he wants to reach out to people today, but he might want to do it in a different way, using different people and with different gifts. So let's remember, God loves to do the same thing in different ways. And let's remember these two stories of how God refreshed his people and honoured the promise that he had made. Many of you will know that as part of my work, I write all age worship songs, songs which I hope are suitable for children and adults to sing together and on their own. But I also like them to be meaningful, which is why almost all of my songs are based on particular verses or passages from the Bible. Last week, a new album of my songs was released. It's called Hold On. Now, hold on. I don't want this to be an advert for my album, but I did want to explain why I wrote the songs for this album. You see, long before this pandemic arrived, I decided I wanted to write some songs about hope, not the fingers crossed type of hope or touch wood type of hope that we hear about often, but the certain hope that the Bible talks about, the certain hope that we can have in Jesus, the hope that we can hold on to. When Simon Peter, one of Jesus' friends, wrote a letter to a group of Christians who were really struggling with life, he said, always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that you have. And when I thought about what that reason was, it came down to one person's name, Jesus. He is the reason for the hope that Christians have. And so this next song is called You Are The Reason and it describes some of the reasons why we can put our trust and our hope in him.
You're the refuge for the scared You're the light that keeps on shining in the blue You're the presence for the lonely You're the good news to be shared It's so much easier to trust someone when you know that they can be depended upon. They are trustworthy. And we can have hope for the future because we hope in our faithful and loving God. This is the end of our service now and we want to say thank you to everyone who's been involved in the service, both in front of and behind the camera. And particularly we want to say thank you to you for joining us. May God bless you. And now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for your company today. If you're watching on YouTube, it will be helpful to us if you could subscribe to our channel. Just press the subscribe button and the bell.